Amen. So we're in John chapter 2 for the first week. We spent three weeks getting through John uh, chapter 1, and we're going to look at this story at the beginning of John um, chapter 2. So what's happened so far? So, so far we've seen um, in John chapter 1, and um, we saw John the Baptist, he was baptizing. Um, John chapter 1 didn't really detail the baptism of uh, Jesus by John the Baptist, but it did, um, John the Baptist did allude to the Holy Spirit um, coming down upon Jesus. Um, so basically the, the chronology of events um, so far in Jesus' life is um, Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4 actually details um, the baptism of Jesus, and we didn't go to that because we're not studying uh, Matthew. But in Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is baptized by John. Then he is led off um, to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil um, 40 days and 40 nights, and then he goes and calls his disciples. Um, that, that temptation is not listed in John chapter 1, but that's the chronology of events. And then after he calls the disciples that he called in John chapter 1, his ministry begins right here in John uh, chapter 2 with this first miracle. And that's what we're really going to look, look at um, this evening, um, this first miracle of Jesus. Now, this first miracle of Jesus with um, the wedding um, at Cana of Galilee is um, definitely uh, the, I mean, this is my opinion, but I mean, I think this is true, is definitely the most m twisted and misused story about Jesus in the Bible. And that's what I'm going to uh, preach through um, this evening, this question about um, what did Jesus do at this wedding? You know, did Jesus get everyone drunk at this wedding? All right. Um, as a matter of fact, as, you, as we read through this story, uh, and then I'm going to prove to you that that's not the case, in order to believe that, it's actually people that believe that, that Jesus sold, or Jesus, not sold, but Jesus made alcoholic wine here at this wedding, you actually don't believe that Jesus got everyone drunk. You actually believe that Jesus got everyone drunker that actually he, he went to a bunch of people that were already drunk, like intoxicated, and then fed them a bunch of alcohol to make them more intoxicated. This is what people believe today, all right, about um, this story. And I mean, you could almost argue that in, in Christian churches today, this is the mainstream belief. I'm not saying churches that have the correct gospel, but I'm saying just in, in mainstream you know, Christianity, where people, you know, are in these liberal churches, this is the, the mainstream belief that Jesus served alcohol um, at this wedding. Let's read through the story, just this first few verses, and then I'm going to prove to you that that is not the case. Look at verse number one um, of this story. It says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. That's important. Mary was there. And I'll explain that in just a few minutes. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So Jesus was invited Mary was invited, and the disciples were invited to the marriage. And they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Just a comment. This is just a, a comment before we even get into the story. It doesn't even really say they ran out of wine anywhere. They just didn't have any wine. Now, people imply that in verse number 10, but that's just a food for thought right there, something to chew on, because you're always told, like, oh, they ran out of wine, and then Jesus made more wine. And, you know, people infer that from verse number 10, but it really doesn't say anywhere that they had wine at, at all. It, it's, it's, they just, they wanted wine, and they didn't have wine. And, you know, Mary said they have no wine. Mary didn't say they ran out of wine. They're all wasted, and they ran out of wine. They need more booze. That's not what Mary said. She said they have no wine. Look at verse number four. Jesus saith unto her, woman... What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus is saying to Mary, to his, his mother, I, I, I have not started my ministry yet. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. I mean, this was, I don't know, I, I, I figured this out at one point. It's not really important. It's over, it's over 100 gallons, I think, if, when you look at these water pots. Large, large pots. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, he, doesn't, he didn't know where it came from. But the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, in verse number 10, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when the men have well drunk, then that which is worse." but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So all he's doing is really commenting 
on how good this wine is. That's all he's doing. And he's saying typically, so this verse number 10, look, I, I don't know this for sure, but verse number 10 fits if they had no wine or if they, they, they had wine. Because if they had no wine and now they have good wine, he's like, what in the world, you know? I mean, most people would put something like that out first. That's all he's saying, okay? And that fits with anything, not just alcohol. That fits with anything. You would put that, if you have a wedding, you're going to put the good stuff out first. You know, they have the, the wedding cake out first, and then you bring the cupcakes out when the wedding cake's all gone or whatever, right? I mean, that's just what people do. Now, I want you to focus on verse number 10 here where the King James Bible says, at the man, every man at the beginning with good wine, and when men have well drunk. Now, it uses the word drunk there, and you know, in American culture, everyone's like, drunk, they're all drunk. That's not what that means. It says the men were well drunk. It's a verb. It's a verb. It's a past tense of the verb, you know, drank. So you, you drank something and, or you drunk something. It's, it's, a, it's the past tense of drink is what it is, okay? Now, if someone is, you know, drunk, that's an adjective. That's an adjective of somebody. If you're saying somebody is intoxicated, if you say, you know, um, Bob is drunk. You're, you're, you're using an adjective to describe, you know, the state of Bob. You know, but this is a verb. This is talking about that men have, pa that it's a past tense of drink. So it's like they've already had enough. They've, they've filled themselves up by drinking. They've had enough. Now let me read for you the NIV. The NIV here in verse number 10, it says this. It says, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. Using a phrase that everybody knows, you can see that it's so funny in that statement that the culture of the NIV, the culture of the day comes out in the NIV, where it literally says too much to drink, which is a, a common term for someone that is intoxicated. So it is making the Bible say something that it just doesn't say. All right? So that's the point there. And then in verse number 11, this is the beginning of the miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. He, he manifests his glory by getting everyone even more intoxicated. I mean, you have to be insane to believe this, first of all. But tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, this is a very simple one to solve from the Bible. I'm going to give you four biblical proofs that this was not alcohol that Jesus served at this wedding, all right? It doesn't even make sense if you know the Bible, you know the nature of God. It makes no sense, which kind of shows you um, where people are coming from and what type of people are pushing this narrative. Um, it doesn't make sense at all because we know the nature of God. We know what the Bible says about these things. But I'm going to give you four separate reasons, not just one, four on how we know that Jesus did not serve alcohol at this wedding. It was a miracle. I mean, this is, this is four and a half. It was a miracle that Jesus manifest his glory, meaning he proved his divine nature through these miracles. And you're saying he did that by, by harming people. It, it's, it's ridiculous. That, that could be five reasons, but that could be one right there. So I'm going to give you four reasons. First of all, go to Proverbs chapter 20. And look at verse number one. Just, uh, let's just look at a couple verses um, talking about wine, the word wine in the Bible. All right, We're not even at um, point number one yet, but I just want to show you a couple verses about wine in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 20, look at verse number one. The Bible says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So here we see um, a couple things I want to point out here. You're going to see this commonly when it's, when it's referencing um, wine in the Bible at times, it will say that you shouldn't drink wine. And then it, it, in, those, in those verses, many times it will also say this word strong drink. Meaning it's not just wine. I mean, you can make alcohol from anything with sugar in it, really. I mean, it's, it's, you can make it from rice or flowers or whatever. People make, I mean, people have found ways to make alcohol out of just about anything. With, with sugar in it, all right? Um, so, wine is a mocker, strong drink in, is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So here we're seeing, don't drink. 
this wine, whatever wine means, okay? Look at Proverbs 31 and look at verse number 4. Proverbs 31, just a few chapters over, and look at verse number 4. Proverbs 31 and verse number 4. So everyone's like, wine in the Bible is alcohol. And I mean, so far, it's, it looks like it. So far, it looks like wine is something we stay away from. It's a strong drink. It's alcohol. Look at verse number 4 of Proverbs chapter 31. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. We see that wine and strong drink put together again. And, you know, um, Solomon's mother is saying, stay away from this stuff. Stay away from it. So the Bible is saying, don't drink it. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and look at verse number 23. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and look at verse uh, number 23. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. And there's a lot of verses like this one where it talks about wine being a blessing, and we're going to talk about, look at some of those. So we saw a couple of verses that said, you know, stay away from wine. And then we're looking at 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. It says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmity. So here the Bible is saying, you know, drink it. You know, you can drink it. And in many places in the Bible we're going to look at this evening, talk about, um, you know, wine is a blessing. You know, that it's a blessing from God. So, I mean, the question is, what? Do we drink it or do we not drink it? What is it? And that's the first point I want to make tonight is that there are different types of wine in the Bible. Amen. It is very clear that there are different types of wine in the Bible. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 23. So the first point tonight is that wine could mean alcoholic beverage equa equal strong drink or something that is not Alcoholic, And I'll, I'll prove it to you from the Bible. Look at Proverbs 23 and look at verse number 31. Proverbs chapter 23, look at verse number 31. Proverbs 23 is kind of the, we're going to go there at the end of the sermon, it's kind of the quintessential, you know, um, don't drink alcohol uh, chapter in the Bible. But look at verse 31 where it says, Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth it itself aright. This here is saying that there is a time in the life of the wine when it should not be consumed. You say, what time is that? Well, look at the, the next verse. It says, verse 32, it says, At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. When, the, the longer it goes, the longer it goes in, in this state, it, it gets more and more potent. It's saying, you know, there's a time when it should not be drunken. In Hosea 4.11, I'll just read it for you. The Bible says, Whoredom and wine and new wine taketh away the heart. And this new wine in the Bible is used in a couple different terms. It's basically wine that is about to be, you know, fermented into alcohol or just starting that process. Or it is, um, I'll show you, it's wine that is just not alcoholic at all yet that is at the very beginning birth of its life. All right? Look at Mark chapter 2. Look at Mark chapter 2. Look at this idea of new wine once again. Look at Mark chapter 2 and look at verse number 21. So we're looking at different types of wine. And here we see in Proverbs 23 that there's a time. There's, a, there's not only a time, but there's a look. You know, when it's red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. It's talking about when it starts to ferment here when the, the wine is, is going through that change where the sugar is turning into alcohol and it's, it, it actually gases, you know, it actually gives off, um, I think it's CO2, I'm not really sure, but um, I think it's CO2, it gives off gas when it ferments. And Mark chapter 2 kind of lists that out for us as well. Look at verse 21, talking about new wine. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment. Of course, this Jesus is making a, a comparison here, but I want to use the, the wine portion. Else the peace that filleth up take away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And then in verse 22, he says this, And no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Else the new wine doth burst the bottles. How would it burst the bottles? Because the new wine has not started to ferment yet, and then when it starts to ferment, it's going to gas. And if that bottle is not flexible with a, with a nice, you know, whatever skins they use to, to keep the bottle, it, it's going to crack and it's going to break. Instead, they need, you know, flexible, strong, you know, new bottles to handle that, that pressure, basically, is what's happening from the fermenting. 
and says the wine is spilled and the bottle will be marred, but new wine must be put in new bottles, okay, so it can stretch and form. But it's talking about fer fermentation of the juice of the grape, okay? It's talking about fermentation here. Look at Job chapter 32. Actually, you go to Isaiah chapter 25. I'll, I'll read for you Job 32, 19. Again, talking about fermentation here. He says in Job 32, you're going to Isaiah 25. In Job 32, verse 19, the Bible says, Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. Again, talking about that fermenting process. He, Job's just using that analogy um, about that fermentation and that gassing of the wine as it ferments. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 25 and verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse number 6. We see another type of, of, of wine here, difference in wine. So we see that there's a time um, when the wine shouldn't be drunk. When it's, start, when it's fermenting, when it started to ferment, it changes color, it's moving, it's good, having that gassing process going on, that chemical change happening. Stay away from it, the Bible's saying. Look at Isaiah 25, 6. It says, In the mountain of the Lord, in, the, in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. So here we see that there is, there's, if there's well refined wine, there's less refined wine. So we see that there can be um, refining of wine. In Isaiah 1, the Bible says, Thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Talking about, you know, something being diluted or watered down. All right? Now look, preservation of food and drink has been going on for thousands of years. It's like been the major challenge of mankind since man was trying to survive, like from the beginning. And man has, I, I don't even think that it's necessary to go into all the different ways that, you know, wine can be preserved. They had to figure out some way to preserve the, the juice from the grape without it just becoming 100% alcohol. So there was all kinds of different ways of doing that and filtering out the impurities and then, you know, drying it out into like a jelly, more of a solid and storing it that way. And then when you wanted the, the juice, you could take it out and mix it with water and dilute it and have grape juice again and not just have complete alcohol. I mean, otherwise you just, oh, I got some grape juice here and you put it in the closet and it's, it's complete 100% alcohol or whatever. And, you know, it, it'd be worthless to try to preserve the actual food that way. So the point I'm trying to make is that there's all kinds of different wines in the Bible and the Bible is pointing out to us to stay away from it when it starts to ferment. Okay. You say, all right, pastor, but where does it say that wine could be non-alcoholic. Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn to Solomon, uh, Song of Solomon, um, chapter 8. Song of Solomon, chapter number 8. So we see that there's all kinds of different states of wine up to this point. We see there's all kinds of different states. There's diluted wine, there's, uh, there's filtered wine, but the Bible is very clear when it starts to ferment, stay away from it. Okay, but is it wine before it starts to ferment is the question. Look at Song of Solomon chapter number 8 and look at verse number 2. I mean, the, people literally ask this question. People argue about this. People argue, could, could wine mean just grape juice? Look at Song of Solomon chapter 8 and verse number 2. It says, I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house, who would instruct me. I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. Now, that sentence, we just have to look at the sentence structure there. Basically, juice there and wine there are the same word. But the reason that it's not used, he, it, would, it wouldn't make any sense to you. would be a bad writer if you used wine twice in the same sentence. He's basically saying, I would cause thee to drink of the spiced wine. He's not even talking about grape juice here. He's just talking about the juice from a, a, a fruit from a pomegranate, he says, of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. He's talking about, you know, the juice of this fruit is what he's talking about, and he's calling it wine. Amen. Look at Isaiah chapter 65 in verse number 8. You say, well, I don't know. Look at Isaiah chapter 65 and look at verse number 8. So in Song of Solomon chapter 8, we see that juice is used as a synonym with wine. Okay, now look at Isaiah 65 and verse number 8. 
Isaiah 65, look at verse number 8. Thus saith the Lord. Is everybody there? Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine. So here we know, okay, it's new wine. Is it going to be put in bottles to be fermented? What is it? As the new wine is found in the cluster. One saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. This is such a great verse right here because it's telling you that just the, the juice of the grape is a blessing of the Lord. It's, it's talking about, it's talking about how, how just like having, having wine is a blessing. But it's obviously not moving itself aright. It's obviously not, you know, turning its color, you know, in, in the cup. It's not moving itself in the cup. It, it's not strong drink. It's in the cluster. Like it's on the vine. How could you possibly argue that, I mean, are we talking about alcoholic grapes? I mean, how could you possibly argue that wine here is talking about alcohol? The problem is we just have this culture where wine is just alcohol. You know, you can't read the Bible. You've got to get rid of your culture when you read the Bible. And just read the Bible for what it says, where it says juice, wine, same thing. And then it says wine in the cluster. You're like, oh, it, it must be. It must mean non-alcohol or just juice of the fruit. You're like, man, this is confusing. How do I know which one it's talking about in the Bible? If it could be either one. Well, if it's a blessing, it's not alcohol. And if God's like, don't drink it at all, it's alcohol. If he's talking about wine, you know, destroying you, or wine, you know, causing your judgment to be, you know, you know, men making merry in their judgment, you know, going crazy and them doing stupid things. He's talking about alcohol. Amen. If he's talking about it being a blessing upon you, he's talking about, look, folks, fruit's expensive. Fruit's expensive. Grapes are even more, they're like the most expensive thing. Grapes are very expensive. Especially if you go and you get good grapes, it's a blessing. I know as Americans, we're like, oh, what? We just have grapes everywhere all the time, especially in California. Look, it's a thing that, it's, it's a rich man's food. It's a rich man's drink, you know, to be drinking wine. That's why, I mean, you have to think about this wedding. Like, weddings are expensive. You have to think about this wedding, and, you know, maybe they didn't have wine. Maybe they weren't rich people. And maybe they were just really happy to have something that they just couldn't afford. That's a definite possibility. But see, we don't think about that today. We don't think about that today. I mean, when we go out and we have barbecues on Sunday nights, and I go out and I buy all these raspberries and all these blueberries at, at Sprouts is where I get all those things. That's very expensive. I don't buy that stuff for my own house because it's so much money. But, uh, you know, we want to have, but we should have that blessing here is kind of my thought. It's a blessing to have that. It's expensive, though. It's expensive. So people don't understand that when it's talking about, you know, being blessed from this in Isaiah chapter 65, verse number 8, it means God has, has given them abundance. It, he hasn't given them alcohol. He hasn't given them beer. He's given them abundance and success to be able to afford high-end things. I don't, I don't shop at Sprouts normally. I don't shop at Vaughn's normally. But sometimes for a treat... You know, we'll go there and we'll get some things there that, that we know we're going to have some friends over or something like that. It's a treat. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. We don't think about that in America because everything is just so abundant. Even the poorest person in America is just has the abundance way more than 99% than of people throughout history. We have to understand that, I mean, it takes, like, it takes like eight oranges to make one glass of orange juice. I mean, think about how expensive it is to make some of these things. So that's the first one. There's two types of wine. There's two types of wine. One God is warning you against, and it is clearly the type that has been fermented or is even starting to ferment. And then there's one that God is calling a blessing. It, it's, it's on the cluster. It's, it's the juice of the grape. It's the juice of the pomegranate. It's a blessing. Why? Because you have abundance. You have abundance if you're, you're able to drink that instead of drinking just water out of a well, right? Here's the second one. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 31. I told you I'd give you four reasons. The first one, I mean, it's just clear. There's two types of wine in the Bible. There's 
the juice, and then there's fermented alcoholic wine. So we can't just look at John chapter 2 and say, oh, it's wine. He's getting everybody intoxicated. You cannot do that because you have to find out what kind of wine it is. And obviously, if it came from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we could just close the Bible and pray right now. All right? But there's two types of wines in the Bible. That is without a doubt clear. Look at Proverbs 31 and verse number 3. Proverbs 31 and verse number 3. It's not for kings and priests is the second one. All right, look at Proverbs 31 in verse number 3. Alcoholic wine is not for kings and priests. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. There's that wine, strong drink. Again, I really think verse number 3 is, is super interesting here, though. Because what does his mother say to him before she tells him not to drink alcohol? She says, don't give your strength to women. And you know what I find super interesting? If you know, if you know or you have ever been in a culture where alcohol is, is, is common and, 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 and it is always the men that drink more. I, I don't know why that is. That's just the way it is. Many times you will find men that drink regularly and the wife hardly ever drinks or doesn't drink at all. And let me tell you something. That man's strength is given unto women because he has a wife most of the time that I have witnessed this myself in my life. Look, I wish I could say like Pastor Anderson that I've never had a drop of alcohol, but that's not the case. I remember starting to listen to Pastor Anderson's preaching, and he said, I've never had a drop of alcohol in my entire life, and I'm like, I wish that was me. But that wasn't me. However, every, I don't want to say, I don't want to throw a blanket on this one, but it's common to see men that drank, men always drank more than the women, and the men that drank, they were just, they were just destroyed by their wives constantly. Because their wives had no respect for them. And their wives just talked down to them. They were always out in the garage or in the corner of the house or out in the wilderness somewhere. They gave their strength unto women. I, I, verse 3, even before verse number 4, is not an accident there. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of the afflicted Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink, and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. She's like, that's talking about kings and priests. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, and look at verse number 6. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, and look at verse number 6. The last book of your Bible, Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 6. The Bible says this in verse 6. She's talking, she says, it's not for kings, it's not for princes to drink alcohol. Look at this. But that's not talking about me. I'm not a king of anything. Well, he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to be him glory and dominion forever and ever. If you're saved tonight, you're a priest. Amen. So there you go. You know, I've even heard the argument with John chapter 2 in the story of the wedding at Cana that, oh, they were all unsaved. They were all unsaved, so Jesus is just like, let's just let them all just get intoxicated and just get drunk. I've heard this before. This is the depths that people will go to. As if, as if, so not only did Jesus have to see that they were unsaved, but they were unsaved people with no hope. Just, just, he just, let's just get them drunk because they're all just a bunch of reprobates. And oh, by the way, Jesus and his mother and all the disciples were invited to this wedding because all their friends are reprobates. It is, it makes no sense, but this is the lengths that people will go to to justify themselves. So we're kings and priests. We're, we're, not supposed to, we're not supposed to drink alcohol. Jesus certainly isn't going to be pushing that on many people that believed on him, the Bible says, that became kings and priests. Isn't that what the Bible says in John chapter 2? That, you know, many people believed. Verse number 11, and his disciples believed on him. And I'm sure many other people there believed on him after they saw this miracle. But, oh, no, only the disciples were the ones that were saved. Everybody else was a reprobate. That's what you have to believe. To believe that Jesus was like, oh yeah, just let them forget their misery. You know, they have no hope. So that's the, that's the next one. Uh, we're kings and priests, and we're, we're not supposed to drink. Jesus wouldn't be pushing that on people that he wanted to. What was the point of Jesus' miracles? 
to show his, to let his glory be manifest to people. To let who he was be shown to people, to the people at the wedding. To show them that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. He's trying to get them to believe on him. I'm not going to go and just get them intoxicated. It's crazy to think. Here's number three. The Bible just says again and again and again, be sober. You're like, oh no, Jesus was, you know, you can drink and it's okay to have alcohol and all this. Well, why does the Bible say be sober? Over and over and over again. 2 Corinthians 5.13, I'll just read you a few. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6. Let us then not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are, who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Titus 2, 2. Let the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. A lot of people say, oh, this just means serious. Why does it say sober and grave then? He's like, let them be serious and serious. It's, it's, it's talking about like having your wits about you by not having alcohol or drugs in your system. That's what it's talking about. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. How about Ephesians 5.18 where it says literally like be not drunk with wine? <laughs> what, what kind of wine is that talking about? It's talking about the alcoholic wine. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. I mean, I could read you, just keep reading you verse after verse after verse, where the Bible is just like, be sober, be sober, be sober. So the question is, like, I mean, you're only sober unless you haven't had alcohol. I mean, you don't get into argument like, well, you know, I can have this many and I'm still sober. No, if you've had alcoholic beverages, you are no longer sober. There may be a spectrum on how drunk you are, but you are not sober at that point. But they just ignore all that. They just ignore all that. Yep, Jesus got everybody intox intoxicated. So we see there's two different kinds of wine in the Bible, very clearly. There's alcoholic wine, then there's just the juice in, of, of the fruit, of the grape, of the pomegranate, whatever we're talking about. And we can tell by whether it's a blessing or God is telling us to, to stay away from it. So it's not just the, the words in the Bible that literally explain that it's new wine in the cluster, but God is literally saying this one is good wine and this one is not good wine. Then we're kings and priests. If we're saved, we're kings and priests. We're to stay away from it. It's talking about just give it to people with no hope that aren't going to get saved. Just let them have it. And then, you know, of course, we're just told to be sober, which means don't drink alcohol, don't do drugs. Be sober. I mean, is there any clearer command than that? Be sober. You're like, I don't know, should I drink, should I do drugs? Be sober. <clears throat> Number four. Necessary for fermentation is this idea that you must have some kind of substance, some kind of, I guess, liquid. Yeah, maybe it doesn't even have to be a liquid. I'm not an alcohol-making expert, okay? But you must have a liquid of sugar in it, but not only that, you must have some form of yeast. And what the Bible calls yeast is leaven. Point number four is this. Leaven is used in the Bible as a symbol or an analogy or a picture of sin. Turn to Mark chapter 8. Jesus himself talked about, used this analogy constantly. So in order for there to be fermentation where that sugar, because what you have is the yeast comes and it mixes with the sugar and the sugar turns into alcohol. All right, look at Mark chapter 8 and verse number 15. So you need to have that yeast, that leaven present. That's why if you could filter out you know, if you can take grape juice and you can filter out and make it super pure and then dry it up, it could make it into like a, a semi-solid. They could store it in like a, a dark, cool place and it wouldn't ferment. And then they could take it and you take a spoonful and mix it with water and you could have grape juice. I don't know how long it would keep or if it was good or whatever. But I mean, this is just methods people had of, of storing wine, non-alcoholic wine. 
All right, look at Mark chapter 8 and verse number 15. You had to get the impurities out because in the grape, where the yeast is on the grape is on the skin. So you have to make sure there's no fragments of that skin inside the juice because you can't store it then because if you would store it, that yeast would start fermenting the, uh, and you just, you just have an alcoholic um, uh, liquid um, if you left it for a long period of time. But look at Mark chapter 8 and verse 15. And he charged them saying, take heed. Beware of the what? The leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. In Luke 12, verse 1, I'm going to just read it to you. You're going to turn to Galatians chapter 5. In Luke 12, actually, you turn to Exodus chapter 12. In Luke 12, 1, it says, In the meantime, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of the people, insomuch that they trod upon one another and began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees. What is the leaven, though? What's he talking about? And then he says, which is hypocrisy. He's talking about sin. Okay, in Galatians 5, 9, it says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see the same thing said, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, meaning, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is talking about those six things that can't be allowed in the church. Why? Because a little leaven will just spread throughout the whole church. A little what? A little sin. A little one of the sins in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11. Fornication, extortion, drunkenness. All these things will spread and spread and spread. Talking about sin equals leaven. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 12. Say, I don't know. I don't know about that. Look at Exodus chapter 12. Look at verse 15. Talking about the Passover meal here. The Passover meal that Jesus, he pictures the Passover lamb. Okay, and if you look at actually verse number 5 of Exodus chapter 12, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, he shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. This is, of course, picturing, you know, Jesus being that spotless lamb of God, right? What did, what did, uh, what did John the Baptist say? Behold, the lamb of God. You know, and he's spotless. He's without blemish. He's without what? He's, he's tempted like we were, yet without sin. Jesus had no sin. There was no leaven there. Look at Exodus chapter 12 and look at verse 15. God, God really drives this stuff home in all these pictures of things in the Old Testament. Look at verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away, not only have the bread unleavened, this is why for the Lord's Supper you eat that flat, hard, doesn't taste good, it has bad texture. Why? Because it's unleavened. You put yeast in the bread, and that's what makes it rise and makes it fluffy. It makes it able to soak up all the butter that you put on it. Instead, you get this unleavened bread. It's like a piece of leather. But this is what they had to eat for the Passover meal. Why? And not only that, not only the unleavened bread, but look at this. Put away all the leaven out of your houses. They weren't even supposed to have any yeast in their house during this period. You think, you think, God, you think Jesus Christ is going to give people leavened wine? Have, have, have you not? These are people that don't even understand the, the, the Bible. They don't understand the nature of God. They don't understand all these pictures in the Old Testament. The reason they eat unleavened bread was to picture, you know, Jesus Christ himself said, I am the bread of life. He's the bread without sin. He's the bread without leaven. This is a picture of Jesus in Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 15. This is what God does. Just like the Day of Atonement. The Passover, you say, what part of the Passover was Jesus? The whole thing was Jesus. He fulfilled the whole thing. What part of the Day of Atonement? Was it the goats? Was it the ram? Was it the bull? Was it the burnt sacrifice? Was it the blood? The whole thing was pictured by Jesus. It's the same thing with the Passover meal. There's no leaven here. Get the leaven out of your house. But yeah, he gave them wine with leaven in it. That was already, that was already, that was, that was fermented and, and was alcoholic. Fermentation is, is, means it's actually rotting, by the way. When something is fermenting, it's actually rotting. It's actually decomposing. It's getting into a decomposed state. But yeah, that's what Jesus gave him, is, is this decomposed, leavened drink. Read the Bible. It makes no sense at all. Jesus is the bread of life, the unleavened bread of life with no sin. It, it, the Bible is clear on this issue. There's four biblical reasons right there. We just keep going. Bible, 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 Bible. I mean, what else you know, do people 
need to see. But you know, at the end of the day, you know what it really is? People just want to drink. And let me tell you this, from a first-hand account, somebody who's even, I probably shouldn't even say this out loud, but has even misinterpreted this story themselves when they were younger. And you know why they do it? You know why I did it? Because people want to drink. That's all it is. They don't know anything about the Bible. We just read through the Bible. People just want to drink, and they will throw the Lord Jesus Christ under the bus to do it. You know what? I mean, when, when you see the truth of it, when you see the truth of it, it's just like, you know what? Just, just say you want to drink. Just, just say you want to drink and, and just leave, leave Jesus Christ out of it. Just be like, you know what? I, I, just, uh, I just like to drink. I had a neighbor like that in Texas. Like, the guy drank all the time. Like, he just, he was, he was, that, he was that guy that, that always had a beer in his hand. Like, no kidding. You go over there to bar or something at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, he's drinking. And he literally told me, like, in the first couple sentences that I met him, I moved into the neighborhood. And he literally told me, he's like, yeah, when I got married, I told my wife I like to drink. I mean, at least he was honest about it. But just say you want to drink, don't throw Jesus uh, under, the, under the bus. But look, the vast majority of people that believe this, I would say everyone, because I can't think of anyone that doesn't meet this criteria. But let me just say, so I don't get a blanket statement and somebody doesn't send me an email or something. But the vast majority of people that believe this, that Jesus gave alcoholic beverages to these people at this wedding, are unsaved and they drink. I've never met anyone that doesn't fit those two criteria that believes this, this doctrine. But here's what's stupid about it. Go back to Proverbs chapter, 20, uh, Proverbs chapter 23. Here's what's really dumb about it, though. They'll sit there and they'll bend over backwards and they'll literally try to twist the Bible just to, to justify their own sin. They, they'll throw Jesus, uh, you know, they'll, they'll make Jesus a sinner. They, what do they care? They're not saved. They don't understand these things. The majority of these people, if there's somebody saved that believes this, they just need to listen to some preaching and, and get themselves right. But look at Proverbs chapter 23. Here's the funny thing about it. It's like somebody that would just go to these lengths like this, they're, they're bending, they're doing all this twisting, they're, they're just doing all this justifying. It's to their own hurt, though. That's the total irony of it. Look at Proverbs chapter 23 and look at verse number 29. Proverbs chapter 23 Look at verse 29. This is kind of the go-to for somebody that drinks. You know, I mean, and if, and if you drink and you're listening to this sermon online or, or whatever, you know, you should stop. Because, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of saved people out there that drink. That's not what I'm saying. But you should stop. Why? Who hath woe? Because you're drinking to your own woe. Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek, oh, here's another kind of wine, mixed wine. Look, and then we see, look not down the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, talking about that fermentation. At the last, it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Look at this now. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things. It means you'll go and you'll do things that you would never have done if you weren't drinking. Yea, thou shalt be as thou that liest down in the midst of the sea. Think about this. Or he that lieth upon the top of a mast. He's like, you'll just go and you'll just end up in like dangerous situations. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll just lay down in some place that's completely dangerous. You'll put yourself in danger, physical danger. And you'll wake up and, and say, they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me and felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You're just going to go and just do it again. So they're sitting here and they're insulting the Lord Jesus Christ by, by twisting this story in John chapter 2, all to argue for and justify woe and all these things coming upon themselves. I mean, to sum up Proverbs 23, what the Bible is saying is that people that drink are morons. I mean, that's basically what it's saying. It's saying they sound like morons. They act like morons. They speak like mor morons, babbling, you know, not making any sense. We talked to a guy today, out soul winning, that was drinking or on something, 
And we're just like, my daughter and I are walking away going like, what in the world was that guy talking about? But he's babbling. He's babbling. They're doing all these things. They look like morons. They destroy their health. They destroy themselves physically. All while thinking they're super smart and good looking and all powerful. I mean, it makes them, it makes them fat and diabetic and, 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 and an idiot. Yet they're arguing for this. They're arguing for this. Look, they're, ta- they're arguing for destroying themselves. Look, I, I mean, the Bible is trying to tell you here that drinking alcohol will do nothing positive for you. And I mean, forget about yourself. Especially nothing good for you, for those around you. But yeah, you get this, this pleasure of, of sin for a season, which is what, like an hour or two or something? And then you feel bad, actually. It literally makes no sense at all. But we have to kind of get our culture, though, folks. We have to get our culture. That's why I say oftentimes just you have to be able, as a, as a, as a Christian, especially somebody that got saved later in life, you have to be able to take everything that you've ever been taught and be able to just throw it away and just go with the Bible. And like that's, I, I get it. That can be a journey for people. But I mean, I remember, I remember when we moved from North Dakota to Texas and we went to the first wedding. I mean, people read this story in John chapter two and they're like, there's a wedding, everyone must be drunk. There's a wedding, it must be, like that's, I, that's what I would have told you. I had never been to a wedding where there wasn't alcohol, never. I grew up in a heavy Catholic and Lutheran um, environment, and it just, it was, it was the culture. It was the culture. Went to Texas, and it was, you know, the Bible Belt. And we went to, my wife had a, a person that she worked with who got married, and we went to this wedding, and there was no alcohol there. It was the strangest thing in the world to me. I'm telling you. I was not saved, but it was, it was so strange to me. Why? Because it's outside my culture. So when people grow up in a culture like that and they read this story in John chapter 2, they automatically just equate wine, wedding, drunk people. Because that's American culture in many parts of the country. Thank God that I'm out of that culture. Thank God my kids are are not going to see that culture. Thank God for that. Because it defines everything about you. You cannot read the Bible with your old culture. That's why the Bible constantly says, become a new man. You know, be born again and then walk as as that new man. But you have to take that culture and throw it away. But people will just back over Jesus. They can't do it, and and they'll just back over Jesus just, just to justify their own destruction. It's the craziest thing. Once, once you're out of that culture and you're looking into it, you're just like, wow, what in the world? And I mean, if you're out of that culture, don't go step one foot into that culture. Don't be like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. I'm going to stop drinking. Look, I've done this too. I stopped drinking before I got saved because I didn't want my kids growing up in that culture. Now, I'm trying to make myself out to be some kind of saint because I, I, I stumbled along the way here. I try to keep one foot in. I'll still go to that thing. I just won't. I'll still go to that hunting party. I'll still go to this, and I'll still go to that fishing trip or whatever. There is nothing more irritating than being around a bunch of people that are drinking when you are not. I would rather stick a pen in my eye. It is insane, and, and you should never do it. That's why you just have to separate from that stuff. Look, you, I mean, you just got to get new friends. You got to hang out with different people. Just stop, get in church, and go that way. Because, I mean, Proverbs chapter 23 is exactly true. I mean, you're going to be just like, just a bunch of people babbling, a bunch of people that are morons and just are the most prideful morons, and you're just like, wow. But that's what these people are doing. They're just justifying their own sin because they want to drink. That's it. And it's very clear from the Bible that Jesus did not go there and get people intoxicated. Which, again, let me say, they don't believe that he got people intoxicated. They believe that he got intoxicated people even more intoxicated. Like he got them even to the point where they're, you know, whatever. 
It's completely unbiblical. It, it's completely false. And look, it's an insult to, our, insult to our Lord and Savior. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.